Supreme Commander is one of the giants of RTS and a game that occupies a special place in many people's hearts. If you like fully real-time games that are big on the macro and spectacle, then you can't go far wrong with it. Hi, I'm Calivan, and today we're going to talk about Supreme Commander and try to understand why its fans hold it in such high regard. Supreme Commander isn't beloved just because it features masses of units on huge battlefields. There's other games that do the same. Nor is it adored because you start with a big robot that builds things, there's others that do that too. And it doesn't have a unique resource system. But what it does have is features, story, scale and gameplay that come together to create an experience that's far greater than the sum of its parts. If you're not familiar with it, you could easily be forgiven for just writing it off as one of many such titles released over the years. From a distance, there's quite a few of them that do look somewhat similar. There's a reason for this, as many of these sorts of games share a common ancestor, Total Annihilation. TA was released at the end of 97, during the initial boom of real-time strategy games. It was very popular at the time and a huge hit with strategy gamers, partly because it was a great game, and partly because it brought a whole lot of new things to the genre. It was genuinely different, and because it innovated rather than just copied what everyone else was doing at the time, it forever cemented itself as one of the classics. Unfortunately, the company behind it, Cave Dog, also stood apart, and not in a good way. While Westwood, Blizzard, Relic and Ensemble all went from strength to strength on the back of their great games, releasing many sequels and follow-ups, Cave Dog lost its project lead and then went bankrupt just a few short years later. This created a big gap in the RTS space, and while we would get many more CNC, Red Alert, Warcraft, Starcraft and Homeworld games, we would never see another attempt at something like Total Annihilation, at least not until 2007. You see, the community hadn't forgotten TA and neither had its creator, Chris Taylor. Since he left Cave Dog, he'd started his own studio called Gas Powered Games, and after creating the successful Dungeon Siege series, turned his focus onto a new project, in a move that must have felt very much like addressing some unfinished business. There was a lot of excitement about it in the preceding years, with scores of preview articles and trade show demos gradually building up the anticipation to levels that would normally end in disappointment. But not this time. Everyone at Gas Powered Games had done their homework, identified what worked well in TA and what didn't, and thought long and hard about the improvements that could be made by starting afresh, taking their time and incorporating all of the things that just weren't technically possible a decade before. Supreme Commander was a commercial success, shifting a million copies on release and at least another million since. Not too bad for a niche genre. Critics rated it very highly and players fell in love with it. The first evidence of their unending passion came in pretty early, when one Australian publication gave it a 5 out of 10 and described it as the saddest moment in the history of the genre, there was such a backlash that Metacritic actually removed that review from their rating calculations. As a long-time fan of the genre, the first thing that really hit me about Supreme Commander was how much it felt like a complete game. The one thing that always bothered me about TA was the lack of cutscenes in the campaign, and how each mission was just introduced with some pretty dry narration. This was a far cry from other games at the time that put a lot of work into getting their stories across, with a mix of FMV, CGI, and other more detailed briefings. I'm a big proponent of campaign modes in RTS games. Don't get me wrong, I love multiplayer battles a lot, but I also love how a good campaign teaches me the mechanics, gives me some interesting challenges and gets me really invested in the game. Aside from giving me a lot of valuable context, it's normally the first port of call for any new player and something that I think is vitally important to the game experience. All of the really successful RTS games, even the ones strongly favoured by competitive players, have historically had great campaign modes, a fact too often overlooked by many developers these days. So what made the Supreme Commander campaign so good? Well, three words, the infinite war. What a great setting for a game of countless battles. It's the far future, and three different human factions have been nuking each other silly for the best part of a thousand years. One of them wants to restore order by nuking everyone else. One seeks a life entwined with artificial intelligent augmentation by nuking everyone else. And the third one is on some sort of alien-inspired pseudo-religious crusade which involves nuking everyone else. 
It's unclear how their initial objectives have morphed into a quest to reduce each other to their component atoms, but maybe that's just what a millennium of war will do to you. It's rich with the cheesy and overly dramatic storytelling found in many of the real-time strategy games of the period, complete with epic cutscenes, surprise attacks, and people shouting at each other to get the hell out of there before being silenced by a big explosion and then radio static. Each of the three factions got its own campaign, and although they only consist of six missions apiece, each one consists of multiple stages and takes a considerable amount of time to beat. Unless you're familiar with the game, it can take quite a while to experiment with unit combinations and approach vectors to achieve victory. You've also got to get into a different mindset from other RTS games and get comfortable with the Flux Economy, a fancy name for a continual stream of resources. You can't win a mission by just building until you reach the unit cap and rolling towards the enemy base, even with the generous limit of 500 units. Your vehicles are slow and their maps are vast, and each battle is much more akin to a war of attrition than a single massive attack. This is another one of Supreme Commander's strengths. There's no point just making a new game that's the same as all of the other games. If you want to stand out from the crowd, you need to be a bit different. The campaign does do a good job of drip feeding you new units, so you've got a bit of time to breathe and aren't forced to try and learn everything all at once. The missions aren't all that time critical, you'll get a few nagging messages from your superiors every once in a while, but generally you've got plenty of time to get to play with all of your new toys and get a feel for the particular needs of that engagement, and the overall game too. It also gives you plenty of time to enjoy the music, which is written by Jeremy Soul, one of my favourite video game composers. His bold orchestral style is perfect for a game like Supreme Commander, and just like it did with Total Annihilation, it manages to emphasise and elevate everything that you're doing. The game does require you to do a lot of things at once, but it's hard not to be impressed at all of the helpful tools you're provided with, especially for something released in 2007. It's dead easy to queue up multiple structures and repeat build queues so that you can spend more of your time focusing on other areas of the map, and the patrol feature is particularly useful for your engineers, allowing them to roam about repairing and reclaiming things as they go. It's especially nice to be able to assign these features to your factories, so that the new units you produce can automatically move along a predetermined path and then assume another duty. Very useful for building a fleet of interceptors that automatically forms a combat air patrol, flying around your base hunting for incoming bombers. It's also got a great little feature that pops up a timer when you make a string of waypoints, so that you can see how long it will take your units to reach each one. Very useful for setting up multi-pronged attacks that arrive simultaneously. While we're talking about features, I think it would be remiss if we didn't mention multi-monitor support. I'm not sure if this is the first time that it's appeared in a strategy game, but it's certainly the first time I remember seeing it. This doesn't just span your viewpoint to give you a larger area, but essentially puts a large full screen zoomable minimap on your second monitor, so you can easily keep track of everything that's happening. From a technical point of view, I don't think it's an overwhelming achievement, but from a UI perspective, you've got to give the developers a lot of credit for both understanding why a game of this scale would have a particular need for it, and then actually bothering to put development time into it. It feels like the kind of decision that can only come from a group of people that have a genuine love for strategy games. I'm not going to do a deep dive into every feature and facet of the gameplay. I'm sure others already have, and if you've not played it, then it's available for such a low price when it goes on sale, that you should definitely just pop it on your wish list and find out for yourself. What I will say is that anyone who is a fan of variety was pretty pleased with what Supreme Commander provided. Between the three factions and across all of the tech trees, there's a lot of units to play with, and a whole heap of defensive and offensive structures too. This is another one of the game's many strengths, as the bounty of options allows players to find a method of perpetuating the infinite war that best suits their playstyle. For those whose favoured strategy is to attack and keep attacking until everything is ground to dust, there are a whole host of vehicles and other gun platforms, from dinky little tanks all the way up to the fat boy, which is probably best described as a tracked mobile battleship slash factory slash fortress. Players who like to keep their opponent off balance have got plenty of ways to achieve that, with amphibious vehicles, transport aircraft and stealth generators, allowing them to hit the enemy where they least expect it, 
and those who like to sit back and strike from afar will be very pleased to find turrets, shield generators and artillery to keep them safe while they reach out with their air force and super weapons. It's a solid, diverse and highly entertaining game system and although it's not perfect, there was nothing else of this scale that existed on its release. That's right, I said it, it's not perfect. Die Hard Subcom fans should probably close their ears for the next minute or two as there's a few things we have to acknowledge. Unit movement can be a little frustrating, which would be fine if it was totally by design but a lot of it is due to some pretty poor acceleration rates and things bumping into each other, especially when more complicated pathfinding is involved. The hard unit cap can also be a bit annoying, not because it exists but more due to how it's implemented. You don't know how close you are to the cap until you reach it and there's no on screen counter and then you have to do a lot of complicated fiddling to pause cues and reclaim or self destruct some less important assets so you can keep producing the stuff that you really need. There are mods that increase this but we're talking about the base game so I don't think it'd be fair to ignore problems that were fixed by third party changes. It also feels a bit sluggish. Not really in raw unit speeds which are totally suitable for this sort of game but more in the responsiveness of most of the land and naval units, especially the naval units. I praised the variety of units earlier but the game does have a tendency to render a lot of them obsolete pretty quickly as you move up the tech trees. A lot of the higher tech units aren't specialists or stronger in certain areas, they're just straight up better in every way and once you've progressed to a certain point there's plenty of things that there's just no reason to build or use anymore. The other thing that's worth mentioning is performance, especially back in 2007. Large multiplayer battles could really suffer if your PC or internet connection wasn't up to scratch. These issues were real and legitimate, but they were not so impactful that they ruined an otherwise excellent experience. Some of these problems were also addressed in pretty short order, as just 9 months later a standalone expansion was released under the name of Supreme Commander Forged Alliance. Forged Alliance was an excellent continuation to the base game, so much so that it became the de facto standard edition and was where many of the community's fondest memories were created. It wasn't a massive overhaul or a radical departure, but more of a natural continuation of the experience. The extra development time allowed gas powered games to make some very welcome improvements to the engine, fixing some of the issues I described earlier with unit movement and responsiveness and bringing in some important balance changes to the multiplayer. There was something for everyone, with new toys for every faction to play with, along with a whole new faction and another set of campaign missions. Forged Alliance is one of those great expansions that takes the original game and turns it into an overall better experience. I don't know a better way to describe it other than it did to Supreme Commander what War of the Chosen did to XCOM 2. Forged Alliance was now the Supreme Commander and would bring many new people into the rapidly expanding community. One of the great benefits of it being a standalone expansion is that you could just join in without requiring the base game and as success breeds success it spawned a very lively modding community so you could play the game exactly how you wanted it. Because the game was so much fun and it had so much variety, it wasn't something you could easily get bored with and people tended to measure their engagement time in years rather than months or weeks. Official support for Supreme Commander would dry up a couple of years after its release, but really that was just one chapter in its story. Driven by an extremely dedicated and engaged community, Unofficial support would take over the reins, focused around a project called Forged Alliance Forever which came into fruition in 2011. Just as Forged Alliance became the standard version of Supreme Commander back in the day, Forged Alliance Forever became the new standard for modern times. It provided balance changes, multiplayer matchmaking and better mod support, as well as bringing co-op play into campaign missions and allowing up to 16 players in multiplayer matches. It had its own separate client and lobby system and is still active to this day. Its popularity has waned in recent years, not unexpected for a game that's 17 years old, but I'm running the client right now and I can still see people queuing up for matchmaking, hosting custom games and looking for co-op play. On the official side, gas powered games did follow up Forged Alliance three years later with the release of Supreme Commander 2, but it never caught on in the same way. It was pretty well received by critics and general audiences, 
but it wasn't what the fans of the first game were looking for, so it never really went the distance. The problem was it was too different and too soon. You see, fans of the original Supreme Commander still had Forged Alliance, not just fresh in their minds, but still installed and running on their systems. Three years isn't a huge amount of time in gaming terms, and the improvements in engine, graphics and UI weren't impressive enough to really catch anyone's attention. Those that did give it a try found it to be a vastly different experience, and not in a good way. The whole design philosophy had shifted, the resource model was different, and there was less variety, and it just wasn't Supreme Commander. It's not the first time we've seen this in RTS, where a sequel comes along that's so radically different from its predecessor that the existing fanbase just isn't interested. Relic had made the same mistake with Dawn of War 2 just a year earlier, and gas-powered games fell into the same trap. There wasn't anything wrong with Supreme Commander 2, and if it had any other name it probably would have been more fondly remembered than it currently is. I quite enjoyed it myself, sure it was different, but it's actually a pretty solid experience and I don't regret buying it for a second. The release of Supreme Commander 2 may have had a bit of an interesting side effect. It's just my own speculation, but I think that it actually rekindled and reinforced the community's passion for Forged Alliance. Supreme Commander 2 showed them that they couldn't rely on gas-powered games to keep their dream alive, and they would need to band together and put their efforts into something like Forged Alliance Forever to ensure that the game they love didn't die. So, why do we love Supreme Commander? Three words, excellence, distinctiveness and longevity. It was a really well made game with a great engine that not only allowed battles on an epic scale, but gave you all of the tools needed to be able to properly control and enjoy those battles. It stood out from the crowd, distancing itself from the smaller scale and fast paced real time strategy games that were on the market at the time, and provided something for players that wanted to go big or go home. Thanks to the vast community support it also endured, and while many other great games would only remain at the front of people's minds for a few months, Supreme Commander became the go-to title for macro-scale RTS games for well over a decade. Supreme Commander won't persist longer than the Infinite War, but it certainly gave it a damn good go, and I think RTS is all the better for it. Hi there! If Forged Alliance is the only game for you, you'll be happy to know that you're not alone. Forged Alliance Forever is still running and people are still playing. If you put the game down a while ago, looking for something a bit more modern, then I suggest you give Beyond All Reason a try. It's not the same game, but it does have some things that you'll feel comfortable with, like the flux economy, tech tiers and large multiplayer battles. Anyway, thanks for watching, and if you enjoyed this video, then General Clark commands you to click the like button before you gate out. Don't be afraid to share your fond memories of Supreme Commander in a comment or on the Discord, and if you want more of this sort of thing, then subscribe to my channel and I hope to see you back soon.